All right. Okay, so we're going to get started. Um, uh, my name is Brandon Wilson, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the Historic Preservation Commission for the City of Somerville. Um, we are right now located in the Somerville Museum, which is a treasure for the City of Somerville. We're very lucky to have and we welcome you into this space here. There's not an exhibit here right now, but we just finished one, Triple Decker Ecology. You might see the sign still there. We're in the process now of actually um, setting up a new exhibit, and there will be many throughout the year. So just come back again for that. Um, tonight, we have the pleasure of welcoming somebody from out of state. Um, he's come all the way from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and he's here because we invited him to come to the flag raising that the city does every year on January 1st um, to celebrate or commemorate um, the first flag raising of the United Colonies. He will tell you more about what that means. Um, Byron um, has a very extensive resume in addition to being the author of the book that he's going to share his findings with tonight. Um, he is also an, uh, an enviral, enviral entrepreneur, a media producer, and a twice former U.S. House candidate. He is a member of the Organization of American Historians, the Missouri Lodge Research, and the past editor-in-chief for NAVA News, which is, in case you don't know what NAVA is, it's a newsletter of the North American Vexiological Association. Um, he is the co-founder of Energy Equity Funding, LLC, and the managing director and central regional executive of the Midwest for New Green Energy Fund. So he um, has a lot of different credentials, but tonight he's going to talk to you about his findings that he did based on his many visits um, to Prospect Hill Tower here in Somerville, um, which we are very appreciative of because he has dug deeply into records that no one else has to put to rest the controversy that might have been brewing before about where the first flag of the United Colonies first came from. So thank you. I'd like to introduce Byron Deleer. Um, we will have an opportunity tonight for questions at the end. We will also, if you purchase a book and want it signed tonight, he'd be more than happy to do that. And we have some other items here that um, to sell historic memorabilia. Um, all proceeds um, beyond the um, go toward the supporting historic preservation activities um, in the city of Summer. So thank you very much for considering any other purchases as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Um, I'm really excited to be here because I have a passion for history and studying history. And uh, when you really focus in on a historical endeavor to unpack and make discoveries, it's kind of like a sleuthing or detective uh, job. And there's no more better detective job than the mystery surrounding what's considered to be the first American flag, which is the Grand Union flag. And that's precisely because we don't have any primary source record of when this flag was designed, the purpose of its design, or the decisions around its adoption. So in order to really divine a origin story for this device, we really need to examine critically the surrounding events that led up to the introduction of this uh, flag and uh, start to piece together its birth certificate, if you will. And to me, um, this represents nine years of work that I've done. Uh, the first American flag book. It's a peer-reviewed historical work. Um, and one of the things that Brandon mentioned was the North American Vexillological Association, and that's quite a, a mouthful of uh, terminology, but the word vexillology is the study of flags. And it's, sometimes it's considered a subset of heraldry, uh, but it also involves uh, looking at social sciences, and semiotics and symbolism, because in many ways, a flag is just a communication device that's like language. Um, flags were taken very seriously a long time ago. I mean, the, the concept of a flagship, for example, 
This is the flag that the admiral is on, and he raises very specific flags as a means of communication to instruct the, the fleet to conduct various maneuvers. That's where the term flagship comes from. So the uh, story of the Grand Union flag, and if you don't know what it looks like, this is it. Obviously, we're in Somerville, so this, this happens to be one of your prized uh, icons. So uh, you know this is kind of uh, basic for you all. But of course, it's, it features the British Union and 13 red and white stripes, symbolizing the union of the American colonies. And it was in use until late 1777, despite the flag directive that Congress passed in June of 77, which added a new constellation. And I want you to reflect on that concept of the word a new constellation. When they added the stars to the canton, they were attempting to create something new. And a description like a new constellation has a lot of hope embodied in it. And the founders were, were Renaissance men. They were men of the Enlightenment and women. Um, and they looked at their role in the nation series building, the nation series of events that were, uh, nation building series of events that was taking place. They looked at it as it, from a very visionary perspective. And that's why they mentioned a new constellation would be added to the flag. But in the, in the time of the Grand Union flag, this was a transitional device because it's comprised of both British and American elements. And there's been much discussion about why the decision was made to use a flag that was perhaps not completely novel. And um, one argument could be made that it was kind of a hedged bet against any charges of treason that might come. Um, most of the founders, of course, were members of the aristocracy in America. They were landed gentry. And they uh, probably knew, and they, they, they definitely knew that what they were doing, uh, if it was considered to be 100% treasonous, then for sure you, it would be a capital offense. Perhaps they thought in some way if they incorporated the British Union in this device, that you know, they could be maybe only 50% treasonous. <laughs> um, so uh, Washington knew in November that all out war was inevitable. And in October, the king addressed parliament. And he said that these are traitors, that they're moving the passions of my subjects, the leaders of the rebellion have designs for an independent empire. So the jig was up, so to speak. And uh, ever since Washington arrived in Boston after the Battle of Bunker Hill, he worked tirelessly for months and months and months leading into the Prospect Hill flag raising to create an army that was truly continental in nature, meaning a nationalized force. And it's important to understand what the background is of the symbols and the devices that communicate a sense of national identity. And things like the name of the nation, United States of America, or things like the Grand Union flag, I mean, on one level, they're just words or they're just a sheet of fabric waving in the wind. But from a social science perspective, these are devices that operate as the connective tissue to unify what we will become as a new nation, a nation of Americans. And so when we look at the primary source record, we see clearly that the British called this the American flag, and the Americans called this the American flag which meant it was truly representative and emblematic of united opposition to British oppression, which meant it was truly a national symbol to uh, represent um, the new nation that was being born. And I've got a zillion slides here, so I hope you don't mind if I kind of move back and forth through them. Uh, th this is a visual aid, and um, 
I would like to just share that, uh, you know, we have kind of an intimate gathering here. So if any of you feel like you have a question that, that comes to mind, you know, please feel free to interject uh, because I think what would be exciting is actually having a dialogue about these issues. Um, you know, one of the questions that I posed on New Year's Day at Prospect Hill is what would it take for you to take up arms against the government? What kind of oppression would you have to feel individually to actually risk everything that you had, your life, your whole universe? And, and you know, back to the idea of national identity, what kind of a sense of community would you have to have as distinct against the people you were fighting in order to make all those risks worthwhile? Because you'd have to have a sense of community. And that's really where the story of Somerville and Prospect Hill comes into play in the foundation of our nation. Because in less than one month's time, we see the introduction of critical galvanizing institutions and symbols that encapsulate the birth of our nation. And those are, on December 3rd, 1775, John Paul Jones raises the Grand Union flag, inaugurating the Continental Navy in Philadelphia. Washington raises the Grand Union flag over the Continental Army and inaugurates the new establishment of the first nationalized force, the Army of 76, on New Year's Day. The very next day, Stephen Moylan Esquire, as I reveal in my book, writes United States of America for the very first time. And he, he wrote it in Longfellow House, which is located in Cambridge. This is Washington's headquarters. And he was operating as the aide-de-camp to Washington when he wrote this. And we'll, we'll, I have some slides that support that. But um, so what's amazing to me and just fascinating to me is not only divining you know, uh, the historical who's and what's, but also unpacking the origins of things. And when you look at that one month of time, at the end of 75 and the beginning of 76, we truly see the congealing of a national identity within the ranks of the Continental Army right here. And in fact, uh, when Moylan is writing Joseph Reed and writes United States of America for the first time, he's accusing Congress of sitting on their hands. And he's saying, why haven't they declared independence yet? The king says we're independent. The king says we're going to start an empire. You know, why haven't they declared independence yet? So I think uh, that was the introduction of the concept of gridlock. <laughs> so this is, of course, the British Union Jack. And uh, this was a shot that I got from some reenactors. Uh, at, uh, I, I believe, uh, um, uh, Fort Ontario on Flag Day in 2013. Where is Fort uh, it's up north. <laughs> yes. So um, one of the things that I found interesting was, because I, I really didn't consider any doors that I would not walk through in terms of trying to find out where these symbols came from, because symbols are like language. Um, they, they're like, they're memes, you know, and, and they have fitness, and they travel through society, and they're carried forward. Like, for example, I'll be sharing with you the red and white stripes uh, in the United States flag could be derived from the British East India Company flag, which was actually identical to the Grand Union flag, which is a whole other mystery uh, because the East India Company flag was in use for over 100 years prior to its adoption as our national flag. But before the East India Company got the red and white stripes, it, it may have came from the Hanseatic League, which is a, a historical nugget of its own, which I'll get into. But um, this next section gets a little uh, esoteric uh, because I started to look at this symbol, which is an eight-pointed star. And... Um, so just uh, bear with me here for, the, for this next uh, description here, because th the, the flag here, when it's a red ensign, it was called the meteor flag. And, and so they looked at this, at the crosses of St. George and St. Andrews as a star figure. 
And if we look in the ancient cuneiform language, uh, the first word for God or heaven is called the dingir, and that was a star figure. So it's basically just a cross and an X superimposed on one another. And cuneiform is, of course, the uh, wet indentations in clay that replaced clay tokens, which was the first form of writing. So when writing was invented, it was not invented to worship a god or sing a song to your loved one. It was rather invented to make an accounting of how many bushels of wheat, how many cows you had, and it was little clay tokens of cows and bushels of wheat, and you would collect these clay tokens. And eventually they got to the point where they would use a wet piece of clay and make little indentations in the clay that said, well, you have 15 bu bushels of wheat, you have you know, 15 cows. And, and that's, that's how cuneiform writing began. And here you can see the dingir in a uh, tablet stone at the time. And this happens to be uh, the same as the Star of Ishtar, which uh, is a Mesopotamian goddess and uh, also known as Astarte and uh, Inanna. Um, Ishtar was considered the god, goddess of everything that transpired on Earth. Um, here is a Babylonian boundary stone that has the Star of Ishtar, and it, it kind of has a progenitor rep, uh, um, depiction of the Trinity because you have three gods represented here to sort of offer uh, legitimacy and authenticity to this boundary stone that says, you know, from this point on forward, I own this land. And you have the, the uh, stamp, you know, kind of like a royal stamp of three gods. And this is Shamash, the sun god, and this is Sin, the moon god, and Ishtar. So interestingly enough, uh, these symbols are rooted not just in arbitrary scribblings in in the uh, wet clay, uh, but they're also rooted in astrology. When you look at the transit of Venus, um, you can see that certain patterns emerge based on its traveling around the sun and how the Earth aligns with Venus. And so the astrologers were connected with the scribes and with the priests, and they would arrive at these symbols. So the, the five-pointed star here is actually a symbol of Venus, which is also emblematic of Ishtar, the goddess Venus. And Ven the planet Venus was uh, Ishtar's planet. So here we go on the uh, journey of the Grand Union flag. Just the facts, ma'am. The history setting the stage. So you have Lexington and Concord in April of 75. And the British want to foray out into the country land to capture a bunch of armaments of the colonists. And as, as you know, the powder house down the road, um, there was an alarm that was set, and the militias gathered to oppose this. So several militiamen, these were farmer soldiers, if you will, uh, they opposed the British, and shots rang out. It was the shot heard round the world. As the British were attempting to march back to Boston, the uh, Americans swarmed the British and harangued them and shot at them from the roadside, from behind uh, fence cover, and there were hundreds of casualties. It was a massive act of war. And John Adams comments after that, the martial spirit throughout this province is astonishing. It arose all of a sudden. So all of a sudden, throughout, the, throughout New England, everybody had, was on edge, and they felt like, as, John, as, as Thomas Jefferson and John Dickinson mention in their de declaration of the causes and necessity of war, they say, we either have slavery on one hand or resistance by force. They, they, they framed it as this existential dichotomy. And they say, of course, we would not choose the former. Resi you know, it, it, resistance is the only choice we have. So Congress started engaging in creating an army June 14th, a Navy October 13th, and November 10th. As I mentioned, on December 3rd, a merchantman named the Black Prince was given by Robert Morris 
to the Continental Navy and turned into a man of war, which they called the Alfred, named after King Alfred, um, who was considered to be the uh, founder of the Royal Navy, the most powerful navy in the world. So this, this is a painting depicting the Alfred, and you can see the Grand Union flag here. John Paul Jones raises the Alfred. This, this, this is uh, the Declaration of Causes and Necessity for Taking Up Arms, which I just mentioned. That's an actual excerpt from the draft that John Dickinson made. And Thomas Jefferson was the other author. As an interesting aside, by the time Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, that was his third run at writing declarations. So he, that was the third time that he had enumerated all the grievances against the king. So um, as much as it's depicted in the musical 1776 as this onerous process, perhaps Jefferson you know, could, could output that speech pretty quickly. Because for years, this was the third run of making declarations such as this. In the Declaration of Causes and Necessity for Taking Up Arms, our cause is just, our union is perfect, our internal resources are great, and if necessary, foreign assistance is undoubtedly attainable. Now, they also, at the same time, Congress issued a peace treaty, um, uh, an olive branch. It was called the Olive Branch Petition, and they sent both to, to the king. So I want you to think about the Grand Union flag as well, because there's an incongruity about the design. You have the independent red and white stripes, which represent the Union, and you have the Union Jack. So it's like, well, what are you guys, what are you doing? Are you, you know? So they sent the Olive Branch petition, and they sent the Declaration of Causes and Necessity for Taking Up Arms. And perhaps both acts were representative of, of two different factions within Congress. The faction that was interested in an accommodation, and the faction that was interested in independence. A British spy comments on Ben Franklin during this time, which is kind of fascinating. He says, Mr. Franklin I find to be a daring, artful, insinuating incendiary. The doctrine he preaches privately is that if American can hold out for two years, they may have any terms they require. So that's suggesting what's called a Fabian strategy, which is a war of attrition. And in fact, George Washington has been referred to as the American Fabius. Fabius was a Roman general that succeeded at, at doing a war of attrition, but he was criticized for being a coward. Um, so, you know, oftentimes the populace wants the generals to just go gung-ho, but in reality the strategy is to backpedal and to whittle down your enemy and defeat your enemy through fatigue. And that's really what turned out to happen. It would, took longer than two years, but it was certainly a war of attrition, both militarily and politically, that caused England to capitulate. Admiral Samuel Graves, after Lexington and Concord, says, we ought to act hostily from this time forward by burning and laying waste the whole country. That's what the British wanted to do, and they burned over 12 ports and towns before New Year's Day. Uh, torched entire cities. Portsmouth, Maine, they torched it. Washington thought that was the most cruel thing that any civilization has ever done. They torched 500 houses and burnt 15 uh, you know, naval vessels. And they were just, uh, it was a scorched earth policy against the Americans. So this is an unsung hero in the revolution, Robert Morris. He's considered the financier of the American Revolution. And he went bankrupt at the end of 1790s. He owned an astounding six million acres in America, six million acres. But with the rise of Napoleon in Europe, there was an economic bubble, all the markets crashed, his speculation fell out, and he was sent to debtor's prison. So when the historians started writing the history of America in the 1800s, they kind of left Robert Morris out. But his, his contributions are on par with Madison, Jefferson, all the founders. Um, he was, he's considered the architect of the American economy. He owned the first two flagship, the first two capital ships for the Continental Navy. He owned the, the first White House in Philadelphia, the city house that the uh, Washington administration was in. 
Um, he actually loaned Washington the equivalent of 100,000 pounds sterling, which equaled $16 million, to transport the Continental Army to Yorktown. So if you can think about what we hear about the French contribution to securing victory for America, Robert Morris was actually getting the Continental Army to Yorktown so that they could have that final battle. Um, another thing, the entire colonial economy and all the currency collapsed at the end of the war, and Morris floated the entire economy on his own personal credit in the form of Morris notes. Um, so he's, a, he's an interesting figure. You know, of course, you may have heard of him because there's a Robert Morris University and, and things like this, and, and there's definitely things that have, have, have uh, come through, but uh, when you look at his contributions, it's astounding, and the list goes on. He was one of only two men to sign both the Declaration of Independence, Articles of Confederation, and the US Constitution, all three founding scripture. Interestingly, he was actually opposed. Oh, go ahead. This gentleman had a question. Oh, I, I just said, you know where he was born? He was born in England. Yes. And he was part of the very successful merchant company called Willing and Morris. And Thomas Willing became the chairman of the first United States Bank. And this is all before Alexander Hamilton began his work in finance. So all of Alexander Hamilton's work was based on Morris's concept of a free market. And here's something to kind of digest for a moment. So we all understand the ideological freedoms that America brought to the table, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of action freedom of religion. Now many of these, of course, were limited to certain classes of individuals in society and America has continued to have to evolve itself in order to get women the right to vote, in order to abolish slavery, et cetera. And it is, of course, a continuing experiment. But these ideological freedoms were also accompanied by another innovation, which was free commerce, free markets. Because before that, the kings and queens had a piece of the action of every transaction. Every transaction was subject to the capricious whims of the crown. And so really America stood from an innovation standpoint on two pillars, these ideological freedoms and the free market and the free economy, the ability to transact freely in the marketplace, kind of like a Freemason. I mean, this is what was established with the Freemasons is that you could go from one town to the other and, and ply your wares as an as a, 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 a operative mason, as a stone builder. So these concepts were then rooted into the foundation of our economy, and Robert Morris really spearheaded that. He did. He he got out of prison. He got out of prison, but he died. He died disgraced and and, wow. and somewhat forgotten. In fact, the the first modern biography of Morris was written in 2010 by Charles Rapalai. Right. Well, you know, some historians that, you know, knew what was really going on have appreciated it. But, you know, in terms of the popular consciousness, he's kind of a, an unsung primary mover, truly. Which, which person? Oh, um, I believe it was uh, Governor, Governor Morris, which was not related. Um, but I'm not sure who the other person is. I, I, that, I don't recall that right now. Yes. That's, that's right. So as I mentioned, John Paul Jones raises the Grand Union flag on December 3rd, 1775 in Philadelphia. This is the inauguration of the Continental Navy. That's the Alfred, which was the Black Prince, which was a merchant ship owned by Robert Morris. And um, the day before, Isaac Hopkins is appointed commander in chief of the Navy. Is that a game that was made at the time? Is that what? Is that a game that was made? No, no, that's a, that's a naval painting uh, that was done later. But it's based on the Philadelphia waterfront, and uh, you know, it's based on what we know what the Alfred looked like, which was a three-masted ship. So a continental, this is a, a loyalist clergyman, clergyman named Bernard Page. He writes on December 20th, a continental and provincial currencies to facilitate this great undertaking, war with England, are emitted, which circulate freely and are daily exchanged for silver and gold. Their harbors by the spring will swarm with privateers. 
an admiral is appointed, that's Isaac Hopkins, a court established, and on December 3rd, the continental flag on board the Black Prince opposite Philadelphia was hoisted. So he's using the term continental flag, which essentially means the American flag, because the word continental meant the colonies in their totality. This is uh, from a spy, a British spy, and she, she mentions, you can see the Black Prince, Alfred, a fine vessel, I believe you know her well, she carries the flag. That's fighting words to the British handlers. She carries a flag? What do you mean? What's going on? There's a war. Isaac Hopkins, Isaac Hopkins commands the Alfred. She has yellow sides, her head the figure of a man, English colors, but more striped. That's also from a British spy. And English colors but more striped undoubtedly describes the Grand Union. Here we have British spy on January 10th saying they have hoisted what they call the American flag, which is the British Union with 13 stripes red and white for its field representing the 13 United Colonies. A war is brewing. No, this was Margaret Manny. Uh, Betsy Ross, that's, a, that's kind of a mythology. So, you know, oftentimes historians have to unpack and debunk inaccuracies. Uh, the Betsy Ross story originally talks about her creating the Stars and Stripes in 76, which is impossible. Um, so she may have been a flag maker in 77, doing, making Stars and Stripe flags. She may have been. But, uh, bef the day before the Grand Union debuted on December 3rd, 1775, we have a record in James Wharton's register, and he was a ship chandler outfitting the Continental Fleet of payment to Margaret Manny for an ensign for the Alfred. So Margaret Manny is the real Betsy Ross <laughs> in terms of, of, of sewing and designing uh, the Grand Union flag, because ensign means a national flag. So in April 2nd, 1776, we see the Grand Union flag depicted on North Carolina currency. And I'll have you take, a, take note of the fact that this is a seven and a half dollar bill. <laughs> so why would you have seven and a half dollars? I've never been able to find what that demarcation is, the significance of it. And I thought that maybe perhaps, you know, maybe a, maybe a bowl was worth seven and a half bucks. You know, so you'd actually make one dollar worth seven and a half bucks so you could just pay it. Although that, that price may be too steep. But uh, you see that the uh, depiction of iconographic symbols communicating this new nation was starting to be incorporated into official documents. The origin of the word dollar comes from the German word taler. And the pieces of eight, of course, was the value of a German taler. So the pieces of eight was considered a Spanish dollar. But you had uh, English pounds, German talers, you had pieces of eight, Spanish dollars, all circulating in, uh, in the colonies at the time. And, and hey, we're gonna, make, we're gonna make up a new thing called an American dollar. Let's see how that's gonna work. <laughs> and like I mentioned earlier, when the, when the economy completely collapsed, it was because rampant inflation, like, you know, 10,000% inflation or something like this. And that's why Morris had to step in and actually uh, commit his own personal credit to support the economy. So four days later, after that uh, $7.5 uh, materialized, you have the first publicly printed evidence of the phrase United States of America. Now, this is not as early as the first documentary evidence of the phrase United States of America, which was January 2nd, which I'll get to in a moment. But I made this discovery in 2012, and I found it fascinating because these are three anonymous essays that appeared in the Virginia, Virginia Gazette, and nobody's been able to find out who the author is of those essays. However, certain phrases in those essays have, have, uh, were phrases that Jefferson had used at a later date. So perhaps the, the sobriquet or the anonymous name, nom de plume of uh, 
of a planter, because that's who signed these essays. Perhaps that's Jefferson. And interestingly enough, there were three separate Virginia Gazettes that were being published in Williamsburg at the time. So I don't know, they didn't come up with a con. Maybe, I think maybe in the spirit of competition, they're like, well, we'll just name our newspaper the same name as them. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have trademark laws back then. So this is a color painting that is contemporary from the summer of 76. And this is of the Royal Savage, Captain Winecoop's Royal Savage on Lake Champlain. So you can clearly see what the Grand Union flag looked like there. This happens to be most likely the first illustration of the Grand Union flag. And this is on a powder horn that the Massachusetts Historical Society has. And this is circa March 76 and it depicted the lines of the Siege of Boston. And you see here, there's a, what's called Ship America. And you can see that the, uh, the artist spelled America kind of funny, A-M-A-R-A-C-A. -A -A -A. And he used Masonic's comp, uh, you know, square and compass for the A's, which is kind of interesting. But, it's clearly that there was no ship of America, so this was a kind of a, a symbol, maybe akin to Plato's ship of state, if you will. Um, and you notice that the flag flying from the stern mast, the position of honor, where traditionally national ensigns flew, you see a Grand Union flag. And this is an interesting thing because I want you to imagine the soldier sitting in the siege lines during the long eight-month siege of Boston where the British and the Americans were facing off each other. And in his boredom, in his, you know, his spirit of, of trying to create something, he's scribbling on his powder horn, which contains his gunpowder for his flintlock. And so he draws this flag, and he, you can clearly see that he puts an X and a cross, which is the crosses of St. George and St. Andrews, and he makes this flag like this. And then he counts the stripes and he goes, oh shoot, there's not enough stripes here. So he adds a bunch more stripes because he clearly wants to have 14 lines, which depicts 13 stripes. Because that was a critical element of the Union. It was not the stars of the British Union that was the Union, it was the 13 stripes that was the Union. You may have seen this picture, it's by Clyde DeLand. Um, and it uh, was, appeared in Harper's Weekly in 1900, approximately. And it, it shows Prospect Hill in Washington raising the Grand Union flag. This is George Washington's account of the flag raising. He says, we had hoisted the Union flag in complement to the United Colonies. Now, a vexillologist in 2006 saw this primary source and said, oh, well, Union flag. He can't mean the Grand Union flag. He means just a British Union flag. And so he writes an article making the argument that Washington didn't raise a striped flag on that day, but rather just raised the king's colors. And so in, in some respect, this research was done to reaffirm the conventional history. And like I mentioned at, in my inter introductory remarks, you have to piece together the entire throw of the events leading up to Prospect Hill to get a sense of what was really going on. And the it, it, attention to issues of formality that Washington carried, the fact that he was disciplined, careful, cautious, and uh, very much interested in symbolism more than any of his contemporaries. Um, you know, he was a Freemason. He understood the issues of, of ritual as not only being a, a question of honor, but a question, it was a virtue. And so the idea that he would raise an English flag, wholly English in design, to commemorate the new army when he knew that all-out war was inevitable, it doesn't really pass the straight face test. Straight face test, you know, it, it wouldn't make any sense. You wouldn't. You would. You would be sending a message that would be disenthralling for your troops to be doing something like that. Nevertheless, when the British spied the. Grand Union flag raising up on Prospect Hill, the British initially focused on the Union Jack because the Continentals had never flown a Union Jack before, although there were stripes. And they thought that this was an act of submission. 
And so in Washington's letter, he says, but behold, it was received in Boston as a token of the deep impression the king's speech had made upon us and as a signal of submission. So we learned by a person out of Boston last night. By this time, I presume, they begin to think it's strange that we have not made a formal surrender of our lines. So he's kind of joking about it. So these are some of the primary source records that describe the Grand Union flag with the exact terminology that Washington used. Union flag. Union flag of the American states. This was actually, uh, this actually appeared in the Virginia Gazette and they capitalized Union flag. So by nature of the fact that it had a British Union in it, it could be referred to simply as a Union flag despite the stripes. Here is the excerpt from Virginia Gazette. You see, the Union flag of the American states waved upon the Capitol during the whole of the ceremony. That's a British red ensign. It also could be referred to as a Union flag. This was used by uh, naval vessels. So this is one of the key figures in the Grand Union flag story. It's uh, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph Reed. He accompanied Washington from Philadelphia to Cambridge to take command of the Continental Army. He thought that there was many cowards during the Battle of Bunker Hill and, and acts of severe disobedience. And he says, the salvation of America depended on immediate reform. We gotta get this army whipped into shape because they're too confused. They're all over the place. They're a bunch of New Englanders. <laughs> Frat, you know, Enlisted men fraternizing with officers, litigious, you know, argumentative. You know, that's, that's, from the Virginian standpoint, that was uh, something that was uh, otherworldly. It was otherworldly to Washington. So here is the actual primary source document of the first documentary evidence of the phrase, United States of America. And you can see it. Capital U, capital S, capital A. It's kind of an interesting story. When I first discovered this, I couldn't believe my eyes because this seemed to be such well-trod terrain for historians. And in fact, I remember reading a series of articles by William Sapphire about the origins of the name United States of America. And he had enlisted the help of a bevy of Oxford researchers and American researchers and wrote about it in the New York Times Magazine. And this uh, trumped his uh, discovery by, um, you know, six or seven months. So for whatever reason, I, I spied this and I looked at it and I started to do my due diligence. And indeed, I discovered that as of today, this is the first time United States of America was written. And of course, Stephen Moylan is an Irish immigrant born in Cork, Ireland. He was Catholic. And he became a merchant in Philadelphia and was in business with Benjamin Franklin. And John Dickinson, if you remember the musical from uh, 7076, John Dickinson's kind of the congressional villain. He's the one that wants to stop independence. But he really wasn't that villainous. Uh, John Dickinson writes a letter of reference for Stephen Moylan, and, he become, and Stephen Moylan becomes a muster master general of the Continental Army. And then uh, when Joseph Reed left Washington, Washington had Moylan become his, his aide-de-camp. And, and he is writing from Longfellow House. And this is where he laments at the fact that Congress hasn't declared independence yet. Can you say more about how you found that document? Sure. So um, there are a number of photographic uh, representations of primary source records that haven't been submitted to automatic character recognition. So you're actually looking at the photographic record and you're not doing a search term, in other words, digitally. And so I, I had found this phrase, United States of America, and I noted the date and it really popped out at me. And it's funny because when I called the New York Historical Society, which actually has the original letter, the Joseph Reed letter. Um, I let them know, did you know that within your collection, 
is the first documentary evidence of the phrase United States of America. And they were like, no, that's amazing. And, and of course, their collection just went up in value by about a million bucks. <laughs> but uh, Christian Science Monitor paid me $150 to write about it in their, in their uh, newspaper. So. Um, um, it was a transcription, actually, of some of uh, Joseph Reed's letters. Like in what institution did you find them? I found it on Google search. Yeah. So it was a, it was a transcription of the letters, and I had no, noted the uh, date that it, it took place. And it was kind of similar to uh, when I found the United States of America in the first publicly published version, which was a year earlier I had found that. Um, in Peter Force's archives, actually. What are the diagonal lines that are, are across? What looks like that section, not Yeah, not sure. Not sure. There's a, a, a higher res resolution rendering, and those lines aren't as prominent. This was actually microfiche that the, uh, the Historical Society had sent to me. So um, there is a higher res rendering on the New York Historical Society website which doesn't have those crosshat, those, those X's. So this is what Moylan's writing in his letter. Look at the king's speech. Why won't Congress declare independence? The king says we're independent. This is another of the eyewitnesses of the, of the Prospect Hill event. And you notice he says, they hoisted an union flag above the continental with the 13 stripes. So here's an actual contemporary primary source that's indicating that stripes flew at Prospect Hill. So to, again, take a revisionist attitude towards this and say, well, maybe they just flew an English flag. Maybe they just flew the king's colors. Here's a primary source that says stripes flew at Prospect Hill. Now, one interpretation is, well, maybe there's two flags. But if you actually look at some of the references of how they describe the canton versus the field, you'll see that sometimes the language describes the canton as above and the field below. So a Union flag above the continental with the 13 stripes would de describe the Grand Union flag. And we see this in other primary source records. Like for example, this is a primary source that says the colors of the American fleet under Commodore Hawkins, which plundered the island of New Providence, were striped under the Union with 13 strokes. So striped under the Union. So it's, it's using that above below convention to describe the flag. Washington engaged in implicit acts of sovereignty leading into Prospect Hill. These last two acts voted by Congress in the first week of November were implicitly acts of sovereignty by an independent nation. They had originated with Washington. Washington talks about the army that he was inaugurating on January 1st. He says, the army is entirely continental. It's a nationalized force. As I mentioned, Washington was a Freemason. This is a depiction of an elaborate ceremony laying the cornerstone for the US Capitol in 1793. Colonel Tobias Lear, was Washington's secretary from 1784 to 1799. Lear was in possession of the Washington Papers for a full year after he died and recorded Washington's last words, which were tis well. Lear was in possession of the papers for a full year, and we have a letter that Lear wrote to Alexander Hamilton saying, there are, as you know, several letters and papers, many which every public and private consideration should withhold from further inspection. So there are 12 missing letters that were written from Joseph Reed to Washington, from Philadelphia to Boston to Cambridge in November and December of 75. They were discussing all sorts of military matters. They were discussing flags. They were discussing units. They were discussing politics. Joseph Reed was kind of Washington's representative to Congress, giving him the insight as to what was going on in Philadelphia while he was stationed in Cambridge. We know these letters exist because when Washington replied to Reed, he said, hey, your letter of the 11th and your letter of the 17th, here's what I think. And your letter of the 12th, here's what I think. 
And, and yet we don't have those letters because they, they should have resided in Washington's papers. So we basically know that Tobias Lear uh, eliminated large quantities of Washington's personal diary and correspondence. He may have been carrying out a dying wish and removing specific documents. He may have been acting on wishes from Martha Washington to eliminate personal correspondence. Or he may have been operating on his own, own accord or perhaps all of the above. But very plausibly, the origin story of the Grand Union flag could have been contained in those 12 missing letters. So the detective sleuthing mystery continues. <laughs> this is uh, a painting of the Grand Union being saluted by a foreign nation, the United Republic of Netherlands. And uh, this is the first salute. This is in November of December. Uh, two different nations saluted the Grand Union on the high seas in a military ceremony, recognizing America as a nation among nations. And here we get into a very fascinating tale, which all is also still being explored. In my appendix in the book, I talk about how is it possible that the United States flag, the first flag of America, was identical to the East India Company flag in use for 100 years prior. Like, is it just a coincidence? And so here is a, a, a compilation of various East India Company flags. You can see in 1685, there was just St. George's Cross because Scotland hadn't joined. But as soon as Scotland joined the Union, you see St. Andrew's Cross and St. George's Cross. But these are all depictions of the East India Company flag. The East India Company, of course, being one of the first transnational corporations. Uh, there were, I, I believe, seven East India Companies in Europe. There's a French one. There's a Dutch East India Company. But the British East India Company was one of the most successful ones. It was founded in 1600. And Sir Charles Fawcett wrote an article in 1937 concluding that on the above basis, the assertion that the Grand Union flag was copied from the East India Company's flag has prima facie of probability. So here I describe some of the bullet points about Robert Morris. Now, what's key is that Robert Morris in 1774, as one of the most successful businessmen in the United States, entered into business relations with Sir Francis Baring. Now, Sir Francis Baring was, was uh, one of the principal members of the Baring Bank, which was the most successful trade bank in England. He was a director of the East India Company. He eventually became the East India Company's chairman. And to give you a sense of how important the Baring Bank was to United States story, the Baring Bank acted as the agent in the Louisiana Purchase. So when Jefferson, when the United States is buying the Louisiana territory from Napoleon, the Bering Bank is doing the transfer of funds and all the negotiation. This doubled the size of the United States. So the Bering Bank was wrapped up in the, in the whole American experiment in, in, in very significant ways. In fact, Robert Morris, during his time in Congress, was largely working with his international network of shipping and trade to supply the American forces in the war. And Sir Francis Baring was supplying the British forces in the war. So you almost see the beginnings of the military industrial complex emerging right, right here in, in this, in this uh, sort of collaboration. And, and it's very interesting that when the Grand Union flag first appears, it appears on Morris's ship. The, the Black Prince, which became the Alfred. Now, also, Benjamin Franklin was in business with uh, a principal in the East India Company. So you have key American decision makers and founders that were aware of East India Company interests. And certainly, they may have been aware of the, of the symbolism of the flag. This is some of the bullet points about uh, Morris and his contributions in the Revolutionary War. I, I discovered a letter that Morris, you all know about the Boston Tea Party. Well, in Philadelphia, it happened a little differently. Robert Morris was the ward of the port, 
And when the tea ships came to Philadelphia, he went and met with the captain and he said, okay, look, you don't want to, you don't want to drop off your tea here because it's going to be a nightmare. So go back to England. So he talks the, the, East, the, the, the ships that have East India Company tea, he talks them into returning to England. And then right after that, Thomas Walpole writes Thomas Wharton, who's a director of the East India Company. And he says, I am sensible that no men in this city, Philadelphia, can serve the East India Company with more fidelity or advantage than the House of Willing and Morris of this city merchants. So you have that preceding the revolution. And um, certainly it becomes more plausible that there's a lineal connection between this symbolism that represents the merchant's flag or an independent sense of economy, independent sense of trade, the East India Company flag as it represented within the British Empire. And let's use this as our flag to communicate that now kings are no longer kings, but now business is king. Here's some of the other details about Walpole and partnering with Benjamin Franklin. Walpole is a director of the East India Company. So I mentioned briefly earlier that there's this real fascinating historical nugget called the Hanseatic League. Who here has heard of the Hanseatic League? Very good. Well, the Hanseatic League was formed commensurate to the Magna Carta. Meaning, it was formed in like 1226 or something like this. And the Magna Carta was 1215. So it's, it's hundreds of years before the East India Company. But it was a collection of about, eventually about 100 Northern European cities that were run by a council of merchants, of business interests, not feudal lords, not kings, not dukes, but business interests. A revolutionary concept, a revolutionary con certainly something that we embraced in, in the foundation of our country in terms of being decidedly separate from royal control. So the Hanseatic League had, uh, was based on a thing called Lubeck Law, which was a constitutional framework, like I mentioned, that was governed by a council of merchants, not unlike Congress. And in 1565, they had the most powerful warship in the world. This was kind of like the first Bismarck, if you will. This was a ship called the Adler von Lübeck, or Eagle of Lübeck. And it had a thousand men on the ship and zillions of guns. And the Adler von Lübeck would, would sail. Uh, the Hanseatic League had an office in London called Steelyard. London was not actually a part of the Hanseatic League, but they had an office there, they had a port there. So perhaps this striped convention of the merchant's flag, you see the hull is even striped. Perhaps this striped convention was adopted by the East India Company as emblematic of the shipping lane, lanes of trade or the emergence of, of trade and, and uh, the legacy of, of business. Here's a model of the Adler von Lübeck. You can see the ensign flying, which is just a striped red and white banner at the stern. Now, this is a fascinating painting because this is depicting Bombay, India, Mumbai. And this is a 1732 painting. So this is 40 years before the revolution. And you see the Grand Union flag right there, 13 red and white stripes, yes. Not, in the, not with the East India Company, it ranged from 9 to 15. What was the significance of those? Um, that has not been determined. There's some mythology about the significance of it. In fact, Tom Hartman, who's usually pretty good on, on political issues, he mentions a mythology about, he, he assumed that, that the East India Company flag always had 13 stripes, and he, then he assumed that this was some mystical number by the Freemasons or something like this, but it was just, it, it's not sourced or backed by any evidence or any primary source records. So it, it just needs to be mentioned that, that there's loads of supposition and conjecture, but there has nothing been discovered that indicates uh, what the purpose was of the, of the number of stripes.
So that concludes my presentation, and um, I appreciate your endurance in persisting through this long, arduous <laughs> narrative. Um, but uh, you know, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And you know, I think one of the most stimulating things to think about as a group here, if you'd like to maybe share with everybody is you know, what you think about Somerville's history and the foundation of our country. And um, you know, one of the things I didn't mention tonight was some of the comments on, on New Year's Day at Prospect Hill seemed somewhat to be referencing the modern situation that we find where many of the democratic institutions in our country are seeming to be under assault. And I, I, I remember the colonel uh, for the British, the British uh, reenactor, he, uh, he said, uh, he was talking to Washington on the horse, and, and he said, you know, why do you think our king's a tyrant? You know, our king is not a tyrant. Citizens in, in Britain have the most constitutional rights of any empire in the world. And he goes, you may someday have a tyrant. <laughs> and I went, and every, everybody went, hmm. <laughs> But um, yeah, if there are any, any, anybody wants to add any comments about, you know, uh, being uh, in Boston here as, as the origins of uh, the foundation of our country. I mean, whenever I come here, I just feel so enriched because there's a plaque or statue every block you go. And, um, you know, we don't have that in St. Louis. <laughs> yes? Um, yeah, because you, you also give the lectures outside of New England. New England, like, essentially, it was um, overwhelmingly pro-patriot, pro-independence, but like in New York and New Jersey, you know, I just looked up just like the, the Loyalist Regiment was founded just, uh, just south of West Point, and there was practically a civil war going on in, 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 in New York, New Jersey, definitely in the south, um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be a 240th anniversary of uh, Battle of, of, of um, New Haven, in July, which was a loyalist assault on New Haven from New York, and uh, just uh, just these divisions, which um, which everybody in the South talks about, but in, the, in in New England, we're not really all that aware of. Right. Yeah, I flashed on on the division between Ben Franklin and his son. <laughs> I mean, he doesn't come any closer to. Uh, the, the war coming home than that. I mean, his son was the governor of New Jersey, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and he was, he was kicked out and had to go, back, go to England or something like this. Yes? We have plenty of, we have plenty of loyalists in this area who had to flee as, as, the, as the war went on. And that, you know, Ralph Street in Cambridge is named for one of them. Uh, yes. You know, the Royal House up in Medford it, it, it was occupied by a loyalist. Uh, I mean, there, there were plenty of them here. Yeah, and when you go up to Quebec uh, or when you go up to Canada, um, Ottawa, uh, you talk to some of the Canadians, and and they're not so uh, hopped up on American independence. You know, they they kind of they kind of feel. Yeah, we they, tried, they, we tried to invade, we tried to invade and take over Quebec in eighteen in the eighteen twelve war. So yes. Um, they're rather happy that they fought us off. <laughs> You know, and one of the, one of the aspects uh, that I shared at Somerville High School uh, today because we were discussing issues of national identity and one of the kids asked, uh, well, why, why did it have an English Union Jack and, and stripes and stuff? And so we started to talk about the transitional effects of, that, of the flag. And um, one of the things I flashed on was um, it's, it's been estimated that about one-third of the colonies were loyalist, one-third were kind of neutral or perhaps disinterested, and then one-third were more independent-minded and interested in independence. And so perhaps the Union flag was even a political, or the Grand Union flag, excuse me, was a political device to get those folks that were on the fence to, to join the independence movement because they weren't necessarily being rude about their assertion of rights. They were pleading with Parliament, saying, we are British subjects, we deserve rights, we deserve representation in Parliament. And of course, the king would, would never have any of that. And in fact, John Adams once was asked, 
Who was your greatest, um, what was the greatest influence in this act of independence that you machinated, that you engineered? And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the assumption was that Adams was going to talk somewhat about his brilliance and, and how, you know, in some egotistical way. But what he said was his greatest accompaniment, his greatest collaborator was King George. Because King George was so tone deaf. And he just hammered and hammered the colonies and didn't see the writing on the wall. Yes? I was going to say David McCullough has been a real, he blew me into a lot of this stuff. He's a fantastic writer. I'm just curious if you ever cross paths with him. I've not met David McCullough. I quote him in the book in a couple places. Uh, one of the things that he mentions is that the 15 months from Lexington and Concord to the Declaration of Independence could be considered the, the most consequential and strangest year in American history. Um, another thing that I, he mentioned in the book 1776 was the fact that the shortage of gunpowder was so desperate that Nathaniel Green, General Green, had actually issued orders to use harpoons instead of guns. And I want you to conceive of trying to stave off cannonade and flintlock fire with spears. <laughs> you know, but, but that's, that's the state of, of, of where we were at. And uh, Robert Morris, during the fall of 75, was engaging in every act of subterfuge you could conceive of to smuggle in war material and shipments of gunpowder. And he sat on the secret committee of Congress that was doing all this international intrigue and negotiations. And Ben Franklin and Robert Morris were both on, on both secret committees of Congress doing this. Um, th there was probably a lot of things that happened that we really don't have records of. Probably a lot of stuff that went down that um, is kind of like the stars at, at the CIA building of, of a sacrifice of, a, of a, an agent or soldier that will never know their name, but they, they're just represented by, you know, what we, any kind of sense of uh, community that we have that we're enjoying the blessings of, that, that's, that, that is the evidence of it, and that's it. Oh. Yes? Um, in, in a book I have from the 1930s, about the flag raising, uh, it said that George Washington was in view of the flag raising and prospect of there's no, there's no primary source record that places him uh, at the site or in view of the site. So we don't have any evidence one way or the other. Um, uh, but uh, certainly he reported on it and he ordered it to be done. Um, there were dispatches continuously going between Philadelphia and Boston, riders and messengers. So one of the things that people that are, are suggesting uh, that only a union, a British union, King's Colors was flown there, he, he says in his article that um, there's no evidence that Washington even knew what the Grand Union flag represented and, or that it even existed. You know, there's no evidence that the commander in chief of the Continental Army did not know about the American flag. And that also doesn't pass the straight face test because you have a British spy writing in January that this is what they call the American flag. <laughs> so if a British spy knows that this is a national, certainly the head of the uh, armed forces uh, knows that, it's a, 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 that, that it exists. And, um, but no, we don't have evidence of who attended the event. Uh, one, of the, one of the eyewitnesses says that 13 gunshots were fired and 13 cheers. And the Continentals have, have welcomed the new year with great aplomb, you know. And so you have this uh, description of a military ceremony. But it was really, really cold because a British soldier writing on the eve of, of New Year's Day said he's writing a letter to his sweetheart or something back home. And he says something like, you know, it is so cold that the ink is freezing inside of my pen as I sit by the fire. <laughs> and so perhaps this military ceremony was truncated. <laughs> but nevertheless, those stripes flew and they continued to, to fly.
uh, uh, from Prospect Hill. And that's another aspect here that I think is important to recognize is that if a Union flag was raised there, in the months following Prospect Hill leading into defeating the British in March with the cannons on Dorchester Heights and ejecting the British, certainly that flag continued to fly. If there was an English flag there, we would have had some other record saying, hey, why is there an English flag flying there? So that's another reason the absence of record actually affirms the conventional history. Can you say something about why the rest of the people that played such a big role at the time, like Washington or Franklin or, or people like this, how they could allow Morris to suffer the fate that he did after everything that he did that we discussed here and you just probably are, are, are you saying why why was Morris's why was Morris's contributions overlooked? So, um, well, I want you to imagine um, someone like Bernie Madoff, although without the, <laughs> without the corruption. So you may have, the, he, Morris was widely thought of as the richest man in America exiting the American Revolutionary War. And like I said, he had amassed through different business relationships in the States an astounding six million acres of land speculation deals because he's like, oh, this is gonna be a growth enterprise. I'm gonna buy up Ohio and I'm gonna buy up here and I'm gonna buy here and I'm gonna buy here and then everybody's gonna build cities there. <laughs> you know? I mean, so he overextended himself and then he wound up being destroyed economically because the market collapsed with the rise of Napoleon in Europe and all the creditors were after him, so much so that he was then put in prison. So um, there, is, there is evidence, and I can't recall the exact phrases, but there is evidence of some of the founders saying, can't we, get, can't we let Morris out of debtor's prison? And I believe that there were even some laws that Congress passed that, to make bankruptcy and issues like that more lenient and that was driven by Morris's case. And I, and I can't cite chapter and verse for you right now, but I, I do recall that that did happen. So you are, you are uh, um, uh, you know, considering that, that some of these issues did come into play with Morris's pedigree, if you will, as being an instrumental part of the revolution and the creation of the nation. And, and he was given some consideration, but at that time, you know, you were still in, in this kind of feudal understanding of debt and, and things like this. So debtor's prison was a real thing. Slavery was a real thing. So the issues of life and death and, and property were a little more carnal than, than, than the way we view them in, in, a, in a more legalistic sense today. Yes? Um, yeah, you mentioned Napoleon was a, a general who emerged out of the revolutionary movement to become a dictator as, um, as was Cromwell, was a general that emerged out of the dictator. It was not a social revolution, like the American Revolution was not a social revolution. And somehow, you know, it's the word symbol, that like Washington himself had very much become a symbol of, uh, um, of a national leader who's not a demagogue. And it's like, he's always portrayed as, as, as a very like, reluctant president. Well, it's, it's actually a key American quality and uh, about the letter of, of him writing refusing to engage in tyrannical king-like behaviors. And the fact that he gave up his presidency after two terms was, uh, was also reflective of that attitude. That he had this idea of being a citizen and you serve the nation and then you return to your farm. And you don't, you don't make the, the leadership a question of being like a family monarch or a strong man thug. And of course, these are issues that we have to process today because of the actions of the executive right now. And what's critical is that today, more now than ever, 
We have to understand the reasons for the founding of our country, the reasons why we have separation of powers and three branches of government and checks and balances, because the founders didn't trust any one man to have the, sh the, the, the mantle of power standing on their shoulders like, like a king. They didn't, they didn't trust that. And this, they designed a system to be in constant conflict with itself. A standing war, if you will. You know, and, and of course, it's emerged into a bipolar system with two parties. Washington didn't like parties. He didn't like political parties. But when you consider people like Cromwell or Napoleon, um, the French Revolution ran off the rails. It didn't have a sense of, uh, of, uh, uh, of you know, coherence based on, uh, on political alliances, and, and, and blood ran from the guillotine. Over 10,000 people were executed, and that's what gave rise to the opportunity for Napoleon to kind of galvanize his power and turn into a tyrant. So that means that we're over, because it's really bright in here now. <laughs> So we will end on Napoleon the Dictator. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.